Well, good morning. What a beautiful sunny morning it is out there. I'm just looking out the window now and see the sun reflecting off the buildings, warming the day. Thank you, Lord. It is Saturday, March the 16th. And I have to tell you, wow, we had a great night last night. The first night of the Browders, seven o'clock last night. <clears throat> Fantastic evening. And uh, you haven't missed it. There again tomorrow, tonight, 7 o'clock at Mountaintop Ministries, 200 Church Road, Ortana, PA. And they will be Sunday, a very full schedule. They will be Sunday, 8 o'clock service, Sunday, 10 o'clock service, and then Sunday, 7 o'clock in the evening. There is no excuse to miss the Browders this weekend. I will tell you that it is a great revival weekend. It is a great worship and praise weekend and wonderful things happen. We already had someone give the heart to Jesus last night. I'm gonna go straight into the King James Bible. This is the book of Exodus and it's chapter 26. Now, while I read this, this is a very descriptive chapter about the tabernacle, okay? Now, some people might say that this is boring and you know kind of repetitive and lengthy, but what I'd like you to do is to close your eyes and picture everything that's being described here, because you can then picture what the tabernacle was like in the wilderness. This is something very specific. God is very precise. God is accurate. God is all-knowing. He is perfection. And he is describing perfection of the tabernacle right here, right down to the very smallest details. In actual fact, he talks about something that's in my heart. A little bit of timber framing goes on when he mentions the tenons. <laughs> so here we go. Chapter 26, Exodus, King James Bible. Close your eyes and picture this. <clears throat> Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet with cherubims of cunning work, thou shalt make them. The length of one curtain shall be eight and twenty cubits, and the breadth of one, cu one curtain four cubits, and every one of the curtains shall have one measure. The five curtains shall be coupled together one to another. The other five curtains shall be coupled one to another. And thou shalt make loops of blue, upon the edge of one curtain, from the selvage in the coupling. And likewise thou shalt make in the uttermost edge of another curtain in the coupling of the second. Fifty loops shalt thou make in one curtain, and fifty loops shalt thou make in the edge of the curtain that is coupling of the second, that the loops may take hold of one another. And thou shalt make fifty tashes of gold, and couple the curtains together with the tashes, and it shall be one tabernacle. And thou shalt make curtains of goat's hair to be a covering upon the tabernacle. Eleven curtains shalt thou make. The length of one curtain shall be thirty cubits, and the breadth of one curtain four cubits, and the eleven curtains shall be all of one measure. And thou shalt couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves and shalt double the sixth curtain in the forefront of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make fifty loops on the edge of one curtain that is outmost in the coupling, and fifty loops in the edge of the curtain which coupleth with the second. And thou shalt make fifty tashes of brass, and put the tashes into the loops, and couple the tent together, that it may be one. And the remnant that remaineth of the curtains of the tent the half curtain that remaineth shall hang over the back side of the tabernacle, and a cubit on the one side and a cubit on the other side of that which remaineth in the length of the curtains of the tent. It shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and on that side to cover it. And thou shalt make a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red, and a covering of badger skins. And thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of shittim wood standing up. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half 
shall be the breadth of one board. Two tenons shall be in one board, set in order one against the other. Thus thou shalt make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards on the south side southward. And thou shalt make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, there shall be twenty boards. And there are forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And for the sides of the tabernacle westward, thou shalt make six boards. And two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle of the two sides. And they shall couple together, and they shall be coupled together above the head of it, unto one ring. Thus shall it be for them both. They shall be for the two corners. And they shall be eight boards, and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And thou shalt make bars of shittim wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle, and five boards, bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle. Five bar boards for the side of the tabernacle, for the two sides westward. <clears throat> and the middle bar in the midst of the boards shall reach from end to end. And thou shalt overlay the boards with gold and make the rings of gold for places for the bars. And thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle <clears throat> according to the fashion thereof which was showed thee in the mount. And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubims shall it be made. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tashes, that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil of the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And thou shalt put the table on the north side, and thou shalt make a hanging for the door of the tent of purple and blue and scarlet, and fine twined linen wrought with needlework. And thou shalt make for the hanging five pillars of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and their hooks shall be of gold. And thou shalt cast five sockets of brass for them, Wow, can you picture this now? Can you picture the colors? Blue, picture blue, purple, and scarlet, gold, silver, brass. That's all you could see is those colors. Blue, purple, scarlet, gold, silver, brass. But notice how God instructed a veil to protect the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. <clears throat> I think sometimes people get a little confused about the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. The Mercy Seat was a lid that sat upon the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where God would appear in between the two cherubims that were facing each other. I think this is a beautiful chapter, the way it describes it. I love the way God talked about sockets and tenons so that the boards would fit into the sockets and not move. But he, he's so precise in as much as he didn't just say one tenon, just slide the board in there. No, he wanted two tenons so that there was precision applied to this. Because the moment you put two tenons in, you must make two sockets. And that's precision. And then every one must be the same. That demands craftsmanship. 
and, and the, the stitching, you know, the cherubims to be crafted and, and, and the stitch work. And it's just the rings to hold it all together of gold and of brass. Can you imagine just how beautiful the tabernacle would be? But there's that veil, because if you did enter into the outer part of the tabernacle, there'd be a veil hiding the mercy seat. It's that veil that was torn when Jesus died on the cross. That veil was torn from the top down. And that was a big veil that they had in the temple, in the second temple. And it ripped from top to bottom to prove that it was God who separated that veil and tore it apart and gave us access to him. We all have access to God now. We don't have to go through the tabernacle. We are the tabernacle. We are the holy tabernacle. God, the Holy Spirit, rests, resides within us. And it's a wonderful feeling. You know, it, it occurred to me last night, I hear people talk about, you know, they could feel the warmth of God around them. I wish I could. God, I can't feel you. God, I cannot see you. God, I cannot touch you. But God, I know you're there. I know you're there. You gave, your, you gave the Israelites your presence in a very physical and beautiful form here. They knew that something special was taking place. Now they know what all that gold and silver was that they borrowed from the Egyptians. Do you remember that? They had all that gold and silver and you kind of wonder to yourself, hey God, why did you tell them they're going out into the wilderness? You know, maybe they need it for when they get to the land of, oh no, this is when they needed it. <clears throat> and they were each to yield it up voluntarily, willingly, graciously. When we give to God, we give to God voluntarily, willingly, graciously, from the heart. Give to God today. Say, God, what can I do for you today? Because you have done, the moment you wake up, God has done so much for you already. If you wake up, in a warm, soft bed, if you wake up in a home that's full of love, if you wake up in a warm, dry, safe home, if you're breathing air, if your family has food in the, in the cupboards in the kitchen, you've got clothing hanging up in your cupboards in the bedroom, you've got a job, you've got prospects, you've got love, you've got a beautiful home somewhere, God has done so much for you already. The moment you open your eyes, why not just turn around and say to him, Lord, what can I do for you today? Because as a Christian, your heart cries out to do something for God today. And you know what God's going to tell you? He's going to say, love me, your one and only God, but then love your neighbor as you love yourself because that's the greatest commandment. So go out and love your neighbor. Show him what you can do for him today. Show God that you can do something good for him today by loving your neighbor. And we know neighbor is an all encompassing phrase. It doesn't mean the guy next door. It means anybody out there, anybody and everybody. Love your neighbor. What can I do for you today? You're driving down the road and you see the garbage can knocked over. Stand it up, pick up the garbage, put it inside, put the lid back on it. You know, that's just loving your neighbor. Drive away. Don't mention it to anybody. Just do it and go and go on your way. You know, just, just do something good all the way up to leading someone to the Lord. Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? If someone's angry at you today, you know, if, if you've done something wrong, apologize, say you're sorry, admit your guilt and say, do you know Jesus Christ? I swear, Carter Conlon did that very same thing when he was in the police force in Canada. He was... <laughs> 
he was doing, he was doing discipleship amongst the police officers. And the captain or whoever it was called him into his office and he says, Colin, he says, I want you to stop this right now. And he was yelling at him and he was saying, he says, now what do you have to say for yourself? And Carter Conlon says, sir, I think you need Jesus in your life. And do you know what? He led that man to Jesus. And he confessed to him that he was having a hard time at home. There were problems and he needed help and he didn't know where to turn. And that was the source of his anger. So yes, you can confront someone, even in an angry situation, and say, do you know what? I think you need Jesus in your life. It takes a bold person, but that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Have a great day. I pray that you will come to see the Browders. And please pray for the Browders. Today is, is kind of like an easier day for them. Thursday, they were in Ohio. Friday, they were here. Saturday night, they're here, but they don't have the traveling. So Saturday is a little bit of an easier day for him. But tomorrow, they're doing 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and 7 p.m. And then they're going home, a long journey. So that's a pretty busy schedule. So come and support them. Come and support them. Because they are all about God. And it's something I promise you, you will never regret doing, coming to see the Browders and praising and worshiping God. You don't have to pay anything. It's free. If you don't want to, there's a box at the end of the church. If you're coming in and you want to make a donation, if you're going out and you want to make a donation, please do. There is no set admission fee. Let the Holy Spirit guide you in your heart as to what you want to do. But please, please, please come and take part in this wonderful, worshipful event, the Browders. Speak to you tomorrow. Have a great day today. Enjoy this day. Enjoy this day. Get out there. Get some of that infrared inside of you. Get some of that vitamin D inside of you and say, thank you, Lord, for this most gracious and wonderful day. Bye for now. Remember, he loves you, and I love you too.